Testament. As we are going through and looking, our learning target is using the chemical formula, using the chemical formula, write the name of the chemical compound. So if you have a formula, can you name it? Well, what are some success criteria that we're going to need to do in order to achieve this learning target? Well, I can. I can identify multivalent ions. Didn't we talk about that yesterday? Okay, so this is a specific success criteria that's going to be important to do throughout this entire process of the ionic bonding, these multivalent ions. Okay, I can use the stock system of naming. Once again, we hit that as a success criteria. I can name and write formulas using polyatomic ions. And finally, I can name binary ionic compounds. I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to switch that and get that binary out of there. I just just I can name ionic compounds. Now go ahead and take out your ion sheets and your periodic tables. We're going to be using those as we discuss this topic today. Now, we talked and hit this about yesterday. I wanted to make sure that we had some stuff on this on our notes. Multivalent ions. Okay? And who can tell me who can tell me how we determine whether something is multivalent or not? Kobe, the oxidation states. Remember, those are the little black numbers that are above the symbol on your periodic table. If there are more than one oxidation states, we have a multivalent cation. Now remember, we're only talking about cations. We're not talking about anions. Well, what do I mean by that? Look at chlorine. Look at chlorine on your periodic table. My periodic table up here, chlorine has 1753 plus or minus. Yours is a little bit different. It says plus 1, plus 3, plus 5, plus 7, and minus 1. So, if you look at that, chlorine takes many different oxidation states. However, when we're talking about ions and ionic bonding, chlorine wants to gain one electron, correct? So, when we are talking about ions, chlorine is minus one. When we're dealing with these multivalent elements, we are talking about cations right here, the positive ions. So we are just dealing with the metals. Do not associate these with the nonmetals. It does not matter the oxidation states for these nonmetals because we already know if they are anions how many electrons they want to gain don't we look at sulfur how many electrons does sulfur want to gain two so sulfur it doesn't matter how many oxidation states when sulfur is an ion it's going to be minus two all right so we're just dealing with metals here okay and we look at the oxidation states. So once again, we talked about iron yesterday. We're going to do a lab Friday on iron one, or excuse me, iron two and iron three. So iron has the oxidation states of plus two, plus three. And as I told you also, even though your periodic table doesn't have it, I've seen iron take a plus six before. Okay, I've seen iron take a plus six. 
So definitely iron is multivalent. Okay, let's look at iridium. I don't even know where iridium is off the top of my head. 77, element number 77, iridium. Iridium has the oxidation states of 2, 3, 4, and 6, based on my periodic table up here. Now, just a mental note with that. Look at iridium. Okay, Isn't one of those darker than all the other ones? What does that mean? What does the darker one mean? Uh, bold is the most stable. Okay, So if I look at iridium, the four is the darkest one, so that is the most stable of those oxidation states of iridium. The stock system, we hit once again. We hit on this a little bit yesterday. The stock system is the Roman numerals. I would say you probably need to know the Roman numerals at least through seven. Okay, at least through seven. I would probably know them all the way up to ten. All right, so. You know, your I's, your V, I is 1, V is 5, X is 10. So I would know those. But what these Roman numerals are is they indicate the charge. Anytime we have something that is multivalent, when we have a multivalent cation, we need to say, okay, what is the charge? Is it iron 2 or is it iron 3? Is it iridium four or iridium three? So we need to put in parentheses the Roman numeral to indicate which charge that ion has. So let's take a peek here. If I have iron with a two plus charge, I have Roman numeral II, which is 2. If I have iron with a 3 plus charge, I have Roman numeral III, which is 3. So I read this as iron 2. Iron 3. Well, what's iron? The next one I can tell you is going to be iron 6. What's 6? A VI. A VI. So iron 6. 5 plus 1 is 6. Anybody have any questions with the Roman numerals? Okay, good. Now let's look at lead. Find lead on your periodic table. PB element number 82. Lead usually has two charges. It's multivalent. So I could have a lead 2 or I could have a lead 4. Lead 2, lead 4. Now, do you think if you don't put those Roman numerals when you're naming this that it'll be counted wrong? Yeah. It definitely will be. Okay? It definitely will be because you need to signify which one of that multivalent element you have. Now, let's look at our ion sheet. Okay, look at your ion sheet. I've included on your ion sheet some Latin names. So if you look on this page right here, the start of this, where the periodic table has, it calls it the classical system. All right. So have you ever wondered, have you ever wondered why? Such as mercury is HG, lead is PB, tin is SN. Okay? Why are those elements <clears throat> having symbols that don't make a lot of sense? Where SN comes from tin, I don't know. Well, actually, I do know. Okay, actually, I do know. But you might not know. <clears throat> Latin names are an older 
type of notation. Okay. What happens is they have an OUS or an IC associated with them. Typically, typically the OUS is going to be the smaller of the two ions. The IC is going to be the greater. That's why up here I have the OUS with the lesser, the IC with the greater. <clears throat> so when we talk about lead, we talked about, we just talked about lead two and lead four. Which one's smaller? Very good, lead two, okay? So lead two would have the OUS ending and lead four would have the IC. So let's see, let's find lead on there. Lead two is called plumbus. Lead four is called plumbic, okay? So that plume, that PB, comes from that plumbus and that plumbic, which would be the Latin word for lead. And that's where we came with the derivative of a, a plumber. Okay, back in the olden days, they used lead pipes to plumb houses. So they called them the plumbers. Okay, if you look at 10, 10 2, Stan us. 10 4, Stan ick. Iron 2, ferrous. Iron 3, fair ick. So the higher one has the IC. The lower one has the OUS. Now, typically, we are going to see these as stock system of nomenclature using Roman numerals because that's the new IUPAC way. It's not really new, but it's not the outdated way that the Latin names are. So if you look here, here's gold, auric, and aurus. Gold three and gold one. So where does the AU come for gold? Right there. We talked about plumbus and plumbic. Now let's get on to polyatomic ions. And like I said, once again, poly is many, ad uh, many atoms. So these are ions that are made using many atoms. Now, you have entire lists on your ion sheets of polyatomic ions. So let's switch to what I call the polyatomic ion list. It's on the back of this. Look at the very, the very, very back page. Okay, The back two, front back of the last one, are all polyatomic ions. But if you look at these polyatomic ions, Almost all, and I said almost, not all of them, almost all of these end in an I-T-E or an A-T-E. Okay, there are a few that have I-D-E endings. Look at the polyatomic list also. Aren't most of them anions? Aren't most of them negative? There's only a couple that are positive. So this ion list is gonna come in pretty handy for you when you're naming these things, all right? So polyatomic ions. These polyatomic ions are covalently bonded. They are covalently bonded together. So when we're dealing with the polyatomic ion, it could be something that is ionically bonded, okay? So it could bond to a metal to be ionically bonded, but that ion itself, that polyatomic, is covalently bonded. So we have both types of bonding occurring when we have polyatomic ions bonded to other elements. Now, let's look at NO2. Find NO2, 1 minus. Find NO2, 1 minus, and those are in alphabetical order there. What is NO2, minus 1? 
What is it? Nitrite. It is nitrite. Now I'm making a point here because here comes NO3 one minus. Okay. The only thing's different is this has two oxygens, this has three. Now, NO3 one minus is nitrate. So the one with the more oxygens has the ATE. The one with the least oxygens or the lower amount has ITE. Now, do you think if you're not paying attention when you're doing a lab that you could confuse nitrate with nitrite? It's very easy to do, folks. That's why we have to read and reread. Because do you think we'll have both of those at one time out? Absolutely. Okay, so we need to make sure when we're in the lab that we're very careful reading. Because if we have sodium nitrite and we have sodium nitrate, are they going to react the same way? No, they will not. Sometimes two elements can form more than two different anions. In this case, we use prefixes, such as hypo, or prefixes such as per. So, I am going to, usually when I talk about these, I think of chlorate. So find chlorate on your ion sheet, okay? Find chlor-8 on your ion sheet. Chlor-8 is right there, okay? chlor eight's my third one right here. Chlor-8 is ClO3 minus 1. Now, how do they differ? Well, I have chlor-8, chlor is going to be one less oxygen than chlorate. So the ATE, the ITE is one less oxygen than the ATE. If I see this hypo, hypochlorite means that it's one less oxygen than the chlorite. So as you can see, okay, per chlorate is ClO4, four oxygens. Chlorate, three oxygens. Chlorite, two oxygens. And hypochlorite is one oxygen. Now, how's this going to come in handy? Well, sometime in WebAssign, you're going to see some things here, folks, that are not on your ion sheets. Okay? They're not on your ion sheets. But you should be able to do some stuff with them. For instance, is bromate on your ion sheet? Is bromate on there? Yes, it is. What is bromate? Okay, what is the polyatomic ion? What's the formula for bromate? Mia, what's the formula for bromate? BRO3, what charge? Negative. BRO3, negative. So, what do you think bromite is? Okay, what is bromite? If bromate is BRO3 negative, what's bromite? BRO2 negative. What would per bromate be? BRO4 negative. So once we know this system right here with the ITE, the ATE, the PER, and the hypo, we can go above and beyond some of the things that we don't have. Okay? I look at that and I say, okay, I see PER iodate on there. And that's IO4 minus 1. So if PER iodate is IO4 minus 1, what's plain iodate? IO3 minus 1. Now, here I have a formula for a chemical compound. 
CuCl2. I know I'm dealing with the elements copper and chlorine, right? I know that I have one copper and I have two chlorines because of the little subscript two. Now, if I am going to name this particular compound, okay, this particular compound, I'm going to get the name of the cation, the Roman numeral, and the name of the anion. Now, how do we know if we need a Roman numeral? What elements need Roman numerals? Hmm? Cations, be more specific. Okay, they are cations, they are metals. Okay, that is, those are both true statements. Why do we need Roman numerals? If they are multivalent. Okay, if they're not multivalent, do we need Roman numerals? No. Look at copper. Is copper multivalent? What charges do copper take? One and two, all right? So, when I am looking at this and naming this, whoops, I look at the cation. And the metal always comes first, ladies and gentlemen. The metal comes first. So I look at the cation and I say, okay, this is copper. Then I ask myself, is copper multivalent? Yes, it is. So I need a Roman numeral. Then I say, okay, what is my anion? Well, that's chlorine, but remember, we don't put I-N-E, we change it to an I-D-E ending. So this is chloride. So the name of this compound is copper 2 chloride. Now, here's one, KOH. I look at this and I see the start is K. What is K? K is potassium. Potassium is a metal, right? Specifically, it's an alkali metal. So I have ionic bonding here, okay? So I have ionic bonding occurring. So I am going to come up with, when I'm naming this, I'm going to say, okay, I know what K is. K is potassium. Now I ask myself, is potassium multivalent? It is not. Do I need a Roman numeral? No. What if I put one? It's wrong. Okay. I don't need it. Don't put it. Now, this second part right here, OH is a polyatomic anion. So find OH on the polyatomic anion list. You'll get to know these, a lot of these, because we'll deal with a lot of them. This is one you will definitely get familiar with. What is OH? Huh? Hydroxide. So, that is right there the name of that formula potassium hydroxide. Here we got Fe. F3. Once again, I check. I always start out checking what type of bonding. Do I have ionic? Do I have covalent? Because we're only learning ionic now, folks, but we name them differently. So I always check. Do I have ionic or covalent bonding? 
How do I determine whether something's ionically bonded? Metals and nonmetals, or metals and polyatomics. Basically, if I have a metal, it's going to be ionic. Iron indeed is a metal. So, I'm going to start off by writing my cation. Iron. Is iron multivalent? Yes. So I'm just going to put parentheses here to remind myself that I need those. Now, I know that I have iron. I know that F is what element? Fluorine. So I'm going to give that a I, D, E ending. So I have iron fluoride. Now I need to determine what iron I have. How I'm going to determine that is I'm going to look at my anion right here. I know that fluorine wants to gain one electron, right? So what charge does fluorine take? Minus one. How many fluorines do I have here? Three. So what's my total minus charge? Minus three. So what's my total plus charge have to be? Plus three. So I can see that I only have one iron. So I'm dealing here with iron three fluoride. So when I'm trying to determine my Roman numeral for my metal, I need to check the anion. I need to check to see what charge the anion has and how many of those. Here's a little bit tougher one. Let's get a little bit tougher, but it's still the same process. I look at this and I say, okay, do I have ionic or covalent bonding? Well, I see tin up there, SN, and I know SN is a metal. So I have ionic bonding. So I see tin. I'm going to write out tin. Is tin, Jamie, is tin multivalent? Yes, it is. So do I need a Roman numeral? Yes, I do. So once again, I'm going to put my Roman numeral there. Now where do I go? Where do I go? Well, I've got this thing right here in parentheses. And what that parentheses tells me is I have more than one of a polyatomic ion. What is NO3? We just saw it on a couple of slides ago. Casey, what's NO3? Okay, as a polyatomic. Okay, look at your polyatomic list. What is NO3? Nitrate. So I have tin and I have nitrate. Now, what charge is nitrate, Casey? Don't be confused. Okay, don't be confused with that little three on the subscript. Just negative. It's one minus. Okay? So nitrate here, this whole polyatomic is one minus. How many of those do we have? We have two of them. So what's my negative charge? Negative two. What's my positive charge going to be? Plus two. So this 10 is 10 to nitrate. One of the common mistakes, folks, that I see, one of the common mistakes that I see is people will name this 10 nitrogen oxide. They just go right along. What element comes where? Okay, not the way to do it. Because this whole thing here, 
is nitrate. Yes, it is made of nitrogen. Yes, it is made of oxygen. But that polyatomic has a specific name. Now, let's look at this one. Once again, this is something you have to commit into memory. Because I look at this right here. Actually, what we're dealing with, folks, on this one is we have two different polyatomic ions. We have NH4, which is a 1 plus, and we have SO4, which is a 2 minus. So those are two polyatomic ions. When you see this NH4 here, you just have to know that that is ammonium. Okay, that's just got to be committed to memory. There's not too many positive polyatomics, but this is one you have to recognize. So NH4 is ammonium. Now, when we have polyatomic ions, we never use Roman numerals with those. Okay, we never use Roman numerals. So NH4 is ammonium. What's SO4? What is SO4, the polyatomic? Quinn, you got it? Sulfate. So, the name of that guy right there, NH4 parentheses 2, SO4, is ammonium sulfate. Ammonium sulfate. Now, we're going to get a bell here, okay? We're going to get a bell. Okay, a couple of things that I wanted to show you just so you're on the same page with WebAssign, okay? Just so we're on the same page with our WebAssign. If I have Fe3, okay, we write it as so, without subscripts, okay? So, we include the parentheses. We include all of the letters. The numbers, though, are not subscript. Is that clear? Now, something else. Do not use capital letters when writing the names of formulas. Okay, so when writing the names, do not cap capitalize calcium or hydroxide. That will be counted wrong. When you're writing formulas, do we need to use capital letters? Yes. Okay. So when writing formulas, capital letters, absolutely. When writing names, do not capitalize them. WebAssign will count you wrong. And I won't feel sorry for you if they count you wrong because I've already warned you. Don't do this. So when writing the names, do not use capital letters. Is that clear? All right. Now, ladies and gentlemen, 